Fire design and structural engineering is something that we need to do for every building. So we need to make sure that the building is safe enough for people to get out if a fire starts. It's also something that we typically leave to the last minute or just typical details. And if you look at the right way, you can make structures that are a lot more safe and a lot more efficient. So let's break down what fire design means, how you need to look at it, and how you can apply it to your structural designs. My name's Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. Before we delve into how you can design for fire, for structural engineering, there's a couple of key things that you need to know. Firstly, what are the three key pillars that you need to know for fire design in structural engineering? It's often abbreviated to SII. And these three principles are really key to make sure your structure is both safe, functional, allowing people to escape during a fire. And these are structural adequacy, integrity, and insulation. So what does this actually mean? The first is structural adequacy. Structural adequacy is very simple and it's in its name. It's the ability to adequately resist the structural loads as the temperature increases. You need to be designing the structure to resist the loads. You don't need to design out of full ultimate loads, but more of a reduced fire load, but you need to also reduce the strength of it as it heats up. There's a number of ways that you can do it, whether you're going in concrete or steel, which we'll drill down later. But it's a key principle that you need to consider when detailing your structure. Will it be structurally adequate underneath the fire load that you're expected to see? The next one, integrity, is as the name suggests, it needs to hold up with integrity to stop flames from passing through it. As it can't break down underneath the fire despite it holding up and allowing one section to go from one area to another area. So you need the integrity to hold up underneath the barrage of flames. We can see a lot of visual examples of where this has occurred, but most recently is in the recent SpaceX flight, where you can see the plasma burning through the joint of the fin as it was coming down. It still managed to hold up over time, but it definitely didn't have the integrity that that joint should have had. And lastly, insulation. It needs to prevent the heat transmission from one area to another. You don't want to turn your structure into a giant oven. Imagine cooking the people inside. And doing touch something, and it's transferred that heat through the structure, it doesn't really have the insulation that it needs. So you need to make sure that you've got these three pillars in any design to making sure that it's resisting for the fire load or fire resistance actions that you need to have. Another key aspect to insulation is also making sure that it doesn't transmit the heat through and set something else on fire. Similar to integrity, you don't actually need the flame to come through to set something else on fire. Just the direct heat, if it's hot enough, can set the other room on fire by just transmitting the heat through it. So insulation is also one of those key aspects. And the required fire rating level of your structure is something that's really important, as this will guide how much structural adequacy, how much insulation, and how much integrity that you need. And they're typically listed as three numbers, like 30, 30, 30, 60, 60, 60, 120, 120, 120. So what does that mean? Different surfaces of your structure. So you've got the top, the bottom, and the sides. So depending on where you are, you may have 60 on top, and 120 underneath, or 30 over and 30 underneath, or a combination of either of them. But it's talking about which surfaces need to be fire rated on your building. The number then dictates how long it needs to have that fire resistance period for. So 30 is 30 minutes, 60, 60 minutes, and so on. And there's also a number of different levels that you typically go with. It's typically 30, one hour, two hours, four hours. Depending on the application, a lot of residential structures are typically designed for one hour. Unless of course you've got a reduced fire load for whatever reason, such as on balconies, or you have sprinklers where you may be able to reduce it to 30 minutes. Two hours and four hours is typically something where you need a lot more robustness. Sometimes in fire docks, we may have an additional fire source, such as a vehicle causing the actions, or you just need that additional protection. So when you're detailing up any design, it's important that you're going through your structure looking for the fire requirements, which typically be specified by the architect. A lot of the time, these are dictated by code. They'll tell you that this area needs to be designed for a certain fire rating. It means that you must hit that or design around it through having additional reduction factors, such as sprinklers to reduce the fire load, meaning that you can design it for a lower fire rating. I'd just like to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of this video, Geeks Outfit, who's kindly supplied this t-shirt and got a special offer for you. So they supply t-shirts for people like us who love engineering, and maths, but they'll be offering 25% discount to anyone that can use the link in my below description. It helps support the channel, but also gets you a nice piece of clothing. So when we start to look at fire rated structures, the first one that comes to mind is concrete. As it always meets the integrity, it doesn't really allow fire to pass through, provided there's no hidden joints. There's a key thing that people often overlook. It's not just the element as well, 
splits joints between them. So you do need to have a fire rate structure. Those joints are extremely important. But let's get back to what concrete does. Concrete is also sometimes good under insulation, provided the fire isn't too long. You see, because it's got a lot of thermal mass, it takes a long time for it to heat up. You can achieve the higher fire ratings by both the insulation and integrity of the structure. Doesn't concrete need steel to keep it safe? So this is where you need to be really careful with your concrete designs, as it's really important on the depth of your steel that's providing the structural integrity underneath those tension actions. The higher the fire rating, typically the deeper the steel needs to be in. So you need enough time for that heat to come through and start to heat up your steel. As you heat up the steel, it will expand and potentially cause spalling, but it also reduces in strength. So most fire rating on concrete structures is all to do with the depth of your reinforcement, especially underneath flexural actions. Something that I just found out recently as well was typically your highest strength concretes can sometimes also perform worse underneath a fire action. As they got more silicates, especially when they have a heat source that's really quick and hot, it can cause a lot of early spalling of the concrete to come off. Due to the expansion of the concrete, it means that you can have a lower fire rating if you've got a high strength concrete. So that's why a lot of the time the lower strength concretes will typically have a higher fire rating. There is a couple of ways around this because it is about the expansion force and what's happening in there. Putting a little bit of fibers on the outside will help protect from those initial cracks that form and hold up a lot better over time. So if you do need to have a high strength concrete, it's also good under fire, probably looking at those fiber reinforcement. It doesn't necessarily also need to be steel. Other fibers will actually perform a lot better as it won't weaken over time as well. So it's a good thing to look into, especially if using high strength concrete and need a high fire rating is looking at fiber reinforcement just on the outside of your high strength column. Steel, on the other hand, it's not great underneath fire. While it's really good in high strength, it does weaken over time. That makes it really versatile as you can bend it and move it and heat it up. But that has a bad effect in your fire rating. While it may hold up underneath the integrity, definitely doesn't meet the insulation and it doesn't meet the structural adequacy as it will reduce strength over time. You can design big steel structures that are big enough that have enough robustness out of it. And effectively, you have enough thermal mass, that means that you can hold up to smaller fires. But typically underneath those bigger fires, you need to be very careful. So it's a lot often you need to do a intumescent paint. So what is that? Intumescent paint is a material that you paint onto your steel column that when the heat approaches it, it will expand and provide the insulation that you need to protect it over time. But it's really expensive or you may need to protect it in another form, such as fireboard or some other action to protect it from the flames. But you don't need to actually protect every single section. A lot of the time, you only need to protect the primary actions because you can make sure that your structure is structurally adequate with the right detailing. This is quite often done in composite structures, so where you've got a combination of steel beams and concrete topping. As you will have continuous reinforcement through there, which is critical to your fire design, even with your concrete structures, means that you can get continuing reactions from forming. So what does this mean? It means that your primary beams, which are the critical ones that are really holding up your whole building, will need to be fire rated. While your secondary beams such as joists that are typically lighter and a lot more often, don't necessarily need to be. So provided you're designing for those continuing reactions to occur during a fire situation, it means that you're allowing the joists to fail and weaken over time and the continuing reaction to take place while the primary structural elements are fire rated. So it means you can significantly reduce the fire rating requirements of your structure if you've designed it correctly. Now you just don't assume that you can not fire rate the joists. You do need to go into design and see where those actions are going and have reinforced for it correctly. However, with the right detailing, you're gonna to lead to a really efficient design underneath a composite structure. The steel is typically one of those things that is not very good. And if you wanna break down the different types of foundations that you have available to you, I've got a link to a video here that'll allow you to select the right foundations for the right situations. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, there's two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube or Patreon member. Just like to give a quick shout out to one of my Patreon, Hassan. Thank you for your support and the support of my other Patreon and YouTube members. As always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week.